Hello, everybody. So uh, it wouldn't be a normal conference if we didn't have some fun at the beginning. So we're running a few minutes behind, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, so this is, I don't know what, I think I call it the 17th. Uh, but welcome to our developer summit at BSD CAN this year. Uh, you're probably already on the wireless if you've been in here for a while. Um, and most of these things in this slide I won't go over because they're normal from most other years. Oh, this one is wrong. So the schedule you can find, um, it's hosted on the foundation's website, but there's a short URL you can get to. You can also find it via the normal wiki page has a link to the schedule. Um, lunch is actually not here this year. That's a copy and paste error from last year. Uh, lunch is actually going to be out in the hallway with the folks who are attending to the tutorials both today and tomorrow. It's the same place where lunch will be during the conference proper. So everyday lunch is outside in the hallway. Badges, I think everybody here probably already has your badge. If you don't have your badge yet, badges are down by the front. T-shirts are not yet here for logistics reasons. Um, I believe they're supposed to arrive later today, but when T-shirts do get here, we'll coordinate and make sure folks get... Microphone, oh, okay, even better. So definitely we should be able to kind of hand out t-shirts by lunchtime or so. All right, is my clicker going to work? So uh, yes, or if, if, if not, shortly. <laughs> but it, the intention, yes, is to stream the summit. Um, So in particular, the stream is live on the project's YouTube channel. <laughs> now my clicker will work. Helps if you have the right window focused. So our gold sponsor this year is the FreeBSD Foundation. <laughs> and we also um, are being graciously provided streaming via ScaleEngine. Uh, so this is our 17th developer summit. Um, you can tell that, you know, things happened here that we won't talk about. Um, but this is kind of how we're doing. We're about the same as last year, this year. Um, so uh, here I have the slide correct. So uh, all the tracks, the, the talks for this year are going to be in this room, both the working group type talks in the afternoon as well as the kind of main talks in the morning. Lunch is out in the hallway. Um, and then tonight we have a dinner all together in the bottom floor of the residence lounge, which is the 90U building. We'll have pizza and drinks. We'll provide sodas, let's put it that way. You can bring other stuff perhaps on your own. Um, so things that are coming up in the future, we have several developer summits uh, later in the year on the calendar. Um, not all of them have pages yet on the dev summit page, but they'll grow them over time. And that's a place you can always check to find what's coming up in the future. So the week after this, um, if you haven't already booked your travel, it might be a little late. Um, Ed is hosting a hackathon um, in Kitchener. Uh, so June 3rd through 7th. At EuroBSDCon in Ireland in September, there will be a developer summit overlapping with the tutorials just as we do at BSDCon. Um, Benedict is hosting a hackathon in Graz. Uh, I believe you're hosting, right? Uh, well, organizing. Organizing, same difference. Um, <laughs> in October. And we will probably have, well, we will have, but we don't have firm dates yet. We will have a vendor somewhere, summit somewhere in the US, um, probably in the Bay Area, but perhaps somewhere else uh, in November of this year. In terms of upcoming conferences for this year, the one that I'm aware of is EuroBSDCon in Ireland in September, as the same place we'll have the decimate co-located with it. Uh, for next year's Developer Summit, uh, we will always, as the folks who organize the Dev Summits, we appreciate your feedback. We also appreciate sponsorship to help um, subsidize the cost of food and AV and rooms and things like that. So if you're interested in sponsoring, uh, please email us at devsummit at freebsd.org. You can also talk to uh, myself or Ed um, or Deb from the foundation. Also, if there are specific topics that you would find interesting that, that you think are something that would be good for us to cover or good for our community, feel free to share that with us as well. And if you have feedback, constructive or otherwise, you can share that. I won't promise that, well, you can share whatever feedback you have and we may or may not listen. Okay, that's for later. 
All right. Okay. You're being funky. So the first talk we have today is actually from the core team. Which I also have on my laptop. Oh, and you did this. Okay. All right, so uh, with me from the core team today, so I'm on core this time, but not next time. <laughs> um, so, but uh, we have several folks who aren't here today, but folks who are here are Benedict, Reuschling, Li Wen, and Ed, as well as myself. Um, and so we'll have a couple of slides we'll go through and then we'll have some time. I know we're a bit behind schedule today, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to hurry through our slides and leave some time for y'all to pester us with questions. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we either made partial progress on or things we did during this term for better or for worse. Um, and then we have a few kind of parting thoughts to uh, the community in general. And then we'll have some time for questions. So what are some things that we kind of worked on this term that we thought were kind of important? Um, early on in the term, we had an idea, or we had, we had some discussions about trying to reduce some of the barriers or perceived barriers, more than actual barriers, between kind of different types of commit bits. Um, because in our, we have received, as individuals, we've gotten feedback from other people in the community that sometimes they feel there's that either, either there's stigmas attached to certain bits or things like that that we don't think are there. And so we tried to reason about ways to make that, kind of make that smoother and, and not have impressions that are false. Um, so that's the first thing we'll talk about. Uh, I guess, yeah, let me run through them and then we'll dig into them. Uh, last year we talked about introducing kind of a, trying to have a, an official project IM solution matrix. We won't talk about that more too much, except that we talked about it last year. Another project that Baptiste started up, uh, we have a kind of a self-hosted video conference thing that's free for people to use in the project. Um, a big one we did kind of have been working on in the last part of our term is spinning up a source manager team to manage source. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our, our survey from this year, both kind of the mechanics of kind of how the survey worked this year and going forward and a few highlights of some results from it. All right, so the first kind of thing that I started talking about was this notion of having a more unified view of commit bits in general and, not, and, and trying to remove any stigmas that might be attached to them or not to them. Uh, so we sent an email back in 2023 where we kind of outlined a plan that we think in particular for one of the aspects is uh, if you are committing to a repository where you don't have a commit bit, but you have a commit bit in another repository, and those have in the past been kind of special, and some of the specialness was just an artifact of the fact that when we originally split our repository into three separate CVS repositories, we had to have three separate access lists because the access list lives inside the repository, like just because that's the way the Perl scripts worked. Um, and then over time, some social things got attached to that that weren't necessarily intended from the start as much as it was just a mechanical feature of like an artifact of how the ACL checks worked. Um, so we sent an email kind of tr saying that we wanted to kind of alter some of the, even the rules that we have in place about how you have to get commits approved when committing across repositories. That in general we think you should just get review when review is warranted. Whether it's within a repository where you have a, bit, have a commit bit where you normally commit or if it's in another repository. That it should be up to each committer's judgment of what review makes sense and when to get approval. When you're doing something that you know you feel really comfortable doing or when it's something that's kind of outside of your area and kind of use your own best judgment. So we sent an email about that. Um, we got not a lot of feedback. The feedback we did get, um, those seem to kind of generally agree with the idea from developers. The thing that we kind of failed on doing is that then we needed to turn around and write up deltas to our rules in the committer's guide to actually kind of formalize it. And we didn't do that. And so that is one thing we will probably talk with with the next core team as a suggestion of something they might want to pick up, or that we would like to pick up and maybe we'll help them with. 
One of the changes we did, though, take during this discussion is we used to kind of annotate committer when a commit was made. If a commit was made by someone who wasn't a committer in that repository, we'd add a little annotation saying that, you know, you committed to repository foo, but you have a bar bit, and we stopped doing that to kind of make all commits just look the same and not call an attention to those commits. So we did make that change. One of the other things we've talked about a bit as well kind of as related to this is right now each repository has uh, somewhat different rules for how we deal with idle commit bits. And when we retire someone who's been inactive and kind of take their bid in for safekeeping, um, part of this is that we have different rules. Like I think some repositories have longer timeouts than others. In some cases it's also some trees we are better about enforcing the rules and some trees we are lazier about enforcing the rules. Um, <laughs> in particular, source we're pretty bad about actually harvesting bits. Uh, I didn't put it on the slide, but actually this core term, we did a better job of paring that down. I think we started with like 20 or 30 people on the list of, of who are getting reminded all the time by the Grim Reaper, and now we're down to like four or five. So that at least is somewhat better. Um, one thing though, we did talk about uh, this idea of kind of bringing more Unity to commit bits in general. We do think that it still makes sense that there is some kind of meaningful distinction between where the tree you kind of typically work on. So for example, we, don't, we think that ports managers should still approve ports bits. Like that they're the ones who are the best ones to make decisions and evaluate who's contributing to being active in ports and kind of warrants a ports bit. And the same with doc. Um, and we believe for a source that will be true with source manager. Like we don't think, for example, that core should then decide to approve all commit bits and there should be one giant single access list. Um, that I don't think that, or really don't think that makes sense. Alan yeah, Alan, do you have a question? No, I think it's more about having them all be 12 months, for example, and all be consistently kind of enforced. Um, I think we would still see it as you can have multiple bits active and each of your bits acts as a reference count on your login account, if that makes sense. Like that you, you know, must have at least one to kind of keep your login shell working. Um, so last year, so I won't, we won't talk about it a whole bunch because we did spend a, quite a bit of slide wear on this last year. Uh, we did announce a kind of project sanctioned um, IAM service using Matrix, uh, Matrix at FreeBSD.org. So that's been up for definitely over a year. It's still kind of the development instance and we're still kind of standing at the production instance, but I know people are using it. Certainly Core used that as kind of our main internal communications channel rather than IRC this year. Um, which was helpful because then you don't have to deal with everybody losing ops and then having random people spamming things you don't want to see in IRC from random bots. Um, and certainly some other teams. Uh, I'll get to source manager in a second, um, but those of us who've been kind of brainstorming and work on that for quite a while, that's what we kind of used for our channels to talk with. And I know the other teams are using channels on Matrix as well. One that we that is kind of new that we've been using but haven't talked about before uh, is Baptiste stood up an instance of, and I'm, it's French, I know I can't pronounce it right, so I'm going to butcher it as English and say Galene, but you, I don't know how it's pronounced. Um, but it is an open source video conference solution that works um, on FreeBSD, also works on other OSs, but we've, people have been able to use FreeBSD on their laptops with like Firefox to connect and work with it with a webcam. Um, so it's a pretty stable um, server that runs, it's like runs in a, in a jail on one of the machines in the cluster. Um, and it works decently well. Occasionally, sometimes we'll have glitches with video and audio. I know Warner and I, we had fun with it two weeks ago. Um, but usually it works pretty well. Uh, um, it's, a, it's kind of, right now we currently have it kind of open so that um, it doesn't require any authentication to join a, a conference that you want to host. We'll see how that works. If we can kind of keep it that simple or if we'll have to change that in the future. We believe that this, our intention is that this is available for, if you're doing something that's FreeBSD related, this is a place you can go and have a free conference room without time limits, or without other limitations um, that you can use to host a meeting, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, we've been using it as core.12 for like the last year or so, or at least the last several months for all of our meetings. Um, the folks who have been kind of meeting and that I'll talk about in a second with planning it out and brainstorming for a source manager, we've been using this for better or for worse. Um, 
I know also Port Manager and some other teams like the graphics folks are using it for their meetings as well. Uh, one caveat with it is that it's, uh, it is, it's designed for use in kind of lecture environments. I think it was developed during uh, the COVID lockdowns. Um, and in particular, one of the things is, while it does have a way to do recordings, the recordings are not quite what you would get from something like Zoom. And that what it decides to record is everybody's individual incoming feed is a separate file. And then muxing those together and mixing the audio and making a nice pretty display that shows all the cameras is left as an exercise to the reader. Um, which is, if you're used to using a recording like Zoom, that's not what you're expecting. So uh, I don't know that we've actually used the recording feature much in core. That didn't seem to be very beneficial. Um, if you have questions about this, uh, there will soon be, if not already, a meet-admin alias that you can email that will poke the right people. In particular, if you want to know how you create and host a group, you will need to email to ask that. That's not on the slides. Okay, so one of the other things I've mentioned a couple of times that we've, that Core has uh, worked on this term has been standing up a source manager team to kind of be the oversight of the source tree and, and, and kind of moving that responsibility out of Core and having Core become a body that oversees kind of the various hats instead of having source policy live inside of Core itself. So uh, Ed Mast, myself, Warner, and Mark Johnston have been kind of meeting on and off for, I put at least, I think at least nine months. Um, I think Mark and I might have even started before, longer than that. I think we talked about it last year at, at BSD can't even. Um, so we've been having lots of discussions and trying to think about what makes sense in the context of a source manager team, what types of responsibilities and roles such a team would would or should have, um, what things it should have oversight for versus not, and trying to understand um, how it would be comparable to like port manager and doc eng, um, and what things kind of would still live in core's side of the fence versus source manager's side of the fence. Um, so we've been, <clears throat> we've also spent some time kind of doing things like bug triage or looking at the open GitHub PRs and trying to do some kind of just working through that to, to try to get a good feel for what we think might be sensible policies to start doing in the future so that we kind of get our hands dirty and are not just making policies out of thin air but doing things based on experience and what seems to work well. Um, we've gotten to the point that we've written a draft charter that's currently being reviewed by CORE. Um, so hopefully that will be, we'll kind of go round and round with CORE on that in the next week or so and get that finished up and affirmed before the next CORE team is stuck with it so that we'll have it finished and not on their plate to deal with. That's our, that's our firm intention. Um, the kind of high level description is that similar to Port Manager and DocEng, that Source Manager will be a team that oversees things that are source specific as opposed to things that cross multiple trees. So specifically, um, source commit bits will be something that belongs to this body rather than to CORE. So they'll be responsible for approving new commit bits, managing the revocation of idle commit bits and things like that. Um, defining policies, for example, when is it appropriate to commit, what types of things or to commit to source, um, what types of rules or policies that are, are source committers required to follow that are specific to source as opposed to things that are generic across all the trees, things like that. Um, and then arbitrating disputes that are kind of within source land. Um, for example, I know Port Manager sometimes kind of deals with disagreements or disputes that arise between ports committers or ports contributors and committers, and Source Manager will have a similar role when it comes to things that are contained within Source. If something is between teams, that's something that still needs to go to Core, and Core will be the ultimate arbiter and kind of like last court of appeal for anything that happens inside of any of our teams, whether it's Source Manager or Port Manager. Okay, so how are we doing on time? So I don't have a clock in front of me. Oh, and it's the wrong time zone. I'm completely screwed. <laughs> I'm still in California for another three weeks. Um, so the last topic we want to talk about before we kind of, or the last topic of things we worked on um, is our community survey this year. So. One of the things when we came into a core of this term, this was one of the things we wanted to kind of make more firm or make kind of 
uh, a firmer basis for. So we've had some previous uh, community surveys, particularly some previous core terms in 2019 through 2021. Um, and those did happen for those three years in a row, but then they kind of fell off when the person doing them either didn't do them or kind of wasn't available or something like that. Um, also, the way that happened, because of kind of just the way the survey was administered and run, the results of those never got published publicly. We kind of, we would talk about them perhaps in a, in like a dev summit, we might go over some of the results, but we never published kind of the raw results publicly, which was something I personally was not very excited about. Um, so some goals that we had is we wanted to have, we think a survey is useful. We think it gives us useful data that we don't otherwise get. Like at, at the dev summit, we get good feedback often from many of our kind of commercial downstreams and vendors. Um, but there's a lot of users who we don't hear from directly at conferences. Um, and we would like to make sure that we're getting kind of as much input as we can and data from various consumers that we have as our downstreams, because we have lots, all sorts of different users that use FreeBSD. And we think the survey is a useful way for capturing more of that data that we don't currently get. Um, but for that to work well, uh, we need it to be consistent. Some of the data that we care about is things where we want to observe trends over time. And the way we're going to observe trends over time is we're able to ask the same question year over year and see how the data changes. Um, some of the things we ask are kind of one-off in the moment questions, but a lot of things that we want to have data about are what are the trend lines in our community? How are things changing over time? And to do that, we need to be able to have data that's consistent year over year. And so we need a way to make sure that it's happening every year. Um, and also we do want, we definitely want to, to the extent that we can, publishes the results publicly and on a kind of consistent basis every year. Um, some things we don't feel are appropriate, in particular, any time that there is a response that's a write-in answer, we don't feel those are appropriate to share publicly, at least without some kind of anonymization. Um, but like for many of the questions, they're like multiple choice or multiple guess, um, or yes, no, or something like that, and you can get a simple bar chart. Those we, we definitely feel should be something that should be shared every year with everyone. So, thinking about our goals for this um, and ensuring that, in particular, we have this sustainable process that's going to happen year over year, we reached out to the foundation to ask them if they would help with this, if they would help kind of ensure that it happens on a consistent basis and kind of have oversight. Um, we also, one of the things they asked from us, though, is that we would like input from the project about what questions you want to ask to make sure that we're asking good questions and getting good data for both the foundation and the project. Um, so we partnered with the foundation this year to kind of help provide stability um, and ensure a consistent process on going forward, not just you know, kind of one-offs, but year over year. Um, and we had some members of CORE work together with folks in the foundation to kind of go over the survey and develop the kind of questions. And I expect that that's going to be something that happens every year where we'll refine our question set collaboratively every time. Um, and one of the things the foundation did is they brought in a survey consultant to kind of help both with uh, working through the questions and tweaking and understanding what we wanted to ask and giving us input on how to frame our questions, but also doing some kind of deeper dives analysis of the results that we got back. So let me go over a couple of results to kind of explain how that looks and why that's different. Yes, Alan. Have we come up with any ways to make sure more of the community, especially the ones not necessarily on the mailing list, actually know about the survey and participate in it? Um, so that's a good question. I don't know if we have a good measure of how effective, so I know that, that the foundation in particular that tried to blast it out on all the social media channels that they have access to. Um, and I know some individual FreeBSD developers did that as well and tried to advertise it as widely as we can. Um, I don't know if we, I don't think we have a way of measuring where people found out about the survey and where they came from, but that's not one of the things we asked. Maybe that's something we'll ask in the future. Um, but I, for myself, I don't have better ideas. I know another issue we ran into is um, we used a specific provider because that provider has features that kind of work, but they also had limitations like they were not, they did not allow people from certain parts of the world to participate. Um, and which was a kind of a trade-off. And there are no perfect answers there in terms of like having the functionality you need to do a survey and some of the reporting you want to do versus dealing with that because they all seem to have the same constraints. But let me go over a couple of the results just to kind of give you a sense. So here's one raw result. 
of, and this is, and the apologies at scale that made it kind of unreadable. So one of the questions we asked, which will be a kind of year over year question to spot trends, is which architectures are people using? Um, and I think that there might be some kind of, this might be consistent with kind of the project's recent direction that we're going to be moving to retiring many of our 32-bit platforms in the next couple of years, uh, given the kind of the raw responses. Um, although an important point to note is that, like, the survey is one bit of input data, but it's not the sole basis for how we'll make decisions. In particular, RISC-V is kind of a special case because RISC-V is a newer architecture that's still kind of in its growing stage. So it's not as much sand with RISC-V. It's harder to get sand, like I only run it in QMU myself, but sand is coming. Um, and so like it has stuff that's coming in the future. Um, I mean, there is some sand now and that's going to get better. Uh, but like, that one's still coming and it's also very actively maintained if you use other metrics. If you look at how many commits it gets in the tree and so forth. So it's a, even though it doesn't currently have a lot of expected use in the next 12 months, it has several other metrics that point to kind of a, a pretty healthy developer ecosystem around it. Um, so this, but this is kind of one data point. Um, but when you look at a raw, a raw result like this, all you're getting is the answers to that question. And you don't have more context around it. So one of the things when we worked with a consultant, they were able to kind of cross-reference things across questions and maybe provide kind of different levels of detail about a specific question. So here, for example, in one of the slides uh, from the, the kind of results that the consultant came up with, you can see that they were able to break down kind of are kind of people who use FreeBSD in a work context, like at their job, versus people who are using it kind of individually, and kind of what maybe different preferences are not tremendously different. Um, but there's some differences in terms of which kind of, are they more prevalent in one environment versus the other. But also I really like this little nugget, which was um, people who said they were going to use ARM in the next 12 months, most of them mentioned that the primary way they were going to use, that the primary workload they use FreeBSD in is in a cloud. And so that's kind of a neat little, I mean, and I think many of us believe that's probably true, that we think like Graviton is how people are using ARM64. But instead of it being an anecdote that we kind of have as a gut feeling that we think is true, it's actual data to say that, yeah, your gut feeling kind of is true. Alan? Do we have numbers on this over time from even just the previous surveys to say, you know, we see risk five is growing whereas ARM is shrinking? We don't have good numbers over time because of the previous results, no. But our hope is that going forward, we will start having results over time. But unfortunately, we're having to start kind of, this is our baseline this year. And that over time in the future, now we'll actually be able to start seeing trends as opposed to starting off with this is our baseline. Real quick, uh, it might be helpful just to, <clears throat> I've got it pulled up here. So we had about 1,500 respondents, just shy of 1,500, um, who heard about the survey through, kind of as you said, John, um, a variety of means, email, Twitter, FreeBSD News, Reddit, Hacker News, and some other media. Um, and that sample size provided 95% uh, confidence, plus or minus 2.6%. One of the things, yeah, I, I don't have it in front of me. Um, some of the, the annotations that are in the report, for example, certain numbers being surrounded by a box, that indicates like a higher confidence for that particular response or that particular thing that was being measured as opposed to others. There's a key at the beginning of the report that talks about it and explains what the annotations mean. So I have two more kind of things from the, from the report I wanted to talk about. Um, one of them was, uh, I know some of us have kind of, one of the things that came up in some of our internal discussions in core this term was we kind of had a perception that things are a little different to, to kind of be very direct in source versus ports. I mean, in terms of kind of where the work originates and who is active. We kind of had a sense that a lot of work happens in source is basically paid for by somebody. Um, whether it's an employer paying a developer to work on things in source or someone being sponsored in some way to work on things in source. Whereas we feel that in ports, the, the most of the work is actually done on a volunteer basis as opposed to being sponsored work done, kind of paid for by an employer of some sort or a, a, a company. Um, so one of the questions, one of the things here, um, there's a couple of things on this slide. We, we kind of ask people, do you, are you a committer versus someone who's not a committer but is a contributor versus a user? Um, and then we did some 
our consultant kind of did some cross-referencing of that lined up with, do you identify as a ports person primarily versus a source person primarily versus kind of other roles? And you can see, for example, that um, we have a higher share of people who consider themselves primarily individual contributors as opposed to corporate users. Um, they outnumber corporate users and ports, and then in source it's reversed. So that, so that kind of matches up what we were thinking internally in core, but again, instead of it being a gut instinct and an anecdote that we think is maybe true, and we, but we don't really have confidence in, we at least have some data that seems to back up the things that we think we've observed. Colin? Uh, on, on that point of uh, people getting paid to work on FreeBSD, uh, maybe next year's survey we could divide up uh, not just do you use FreeBSD at work, but do you, do you work on FreeBSD at work? Because I know there's a lot, there's a lot of people who are your know, sysadmins and they, they administer FreeBSD servers at work, but their contributions to FreeBSD are all, all, all volunteer work. Right, and, and in particular, there's also one of the things that I think has come up in our discussions post-survey is there's kind of actually two meanings for what makes corporate versus individual. There's kind of the downstreams, people who consume FreeBSD in those environments, and there's kind of the contributors and how are you contributing. So you may be contributing uh, out of a corporate environment, um, but then also you use it at home on your laptop, which is not a corporate use case. Um, or like, you're, you know, if you're running desktop, you may work on something that's a very server workload and work, but then use KDE at home. And those are not quite a one-to-one -one matchup, right? Those are different use cases. And then on the reverse, you may be someone who is doing stuff, maintaining ports on a, or on a volunteer basis, but actually that turns into somebody else's product that they're using downstream with a, a different consumer. And then I had one more. And there are several questions that I think are interesting, but we, don't, we have limited time. And I would encourage you all to go look at the results. I know the link was sent to developers. that You can download both the raw PDF, kind of like the first question, but also this presentation that has these kind of um, more annotated and refined results. Um, so this one talks, this is a question that was kind of, the main question is kind of how did you first learn about FreeBSD? And then the thing that's kind of interesting here is we were able to split it up based on how long have you been using FreeBSD and compare how do people have been using FreeBSD for a long time get introduced to FreeBSD as opposed to people who are newer users to FreeBSD and to understand how those populations differ a bit. So for example, many of us graybeards, because I'll put my, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in the last column. Um, we mostly found out about FreeBSD through word of mouth. Uh, uh, or some of us discovered randomly on our own, but our primary thing was word of mouth. Um, also, like myself, I was exposed at school. That's kind of where I first learned about FreeBSD. But those trends don't quite match up the same um, for more of our younger crowd and our more recent users. We still, for, for those users, actually many of them are finding it randomly on their own, which is maybe not the best way to find out about us. We would rather have a more deterministic way. But one thing I found really interesting was um, this one that has grown over time, which is researching alternatives. And in particular, um, when looking at some of the kind of write-in answers, primarily what people would mention is alternatives to Linux. And so that m our younger kind of users that we are attracting now, they're looking for something as an alternative to Linux. So maybe one of the things we need to think about, for example, with our documentation going forward, is we need to have more tailored content that's for those types of users as opposed to just generic how to use FreeBSD. Do we need to be explaining a bit more of how do you kind of map what you have a model in your head of how Linux works and how does those kind of concepts carry over into FreeBSD to be able to, to cater to that specific kind of demographic that's now making up our younger users? or newer users, perhaps. Alan? Was the podcasts and things like that an option on the survey for how people heard about FreeBSD? Yes, actually, yeah. Um, we just don't have all the questions up. Um, no, uh, so like one of the questions we had that's kind of interesting is we asked like, how do you stay current with FreeBSD? How do you find out? Um, and there was a lot of diversity on that. It is true that, for example, Committers and people who have been around for 15 years love to use the mailing list to decide what's going on. And that's less true if you're either a contributor or you're younger. <laughs> um, and definitely things like the podcast, even the journal, kind of rated pretty highly in terms of places people would go to to, to kind of keep up with what's going on. Um, and I don't think that was very surprising, but again, in many cases, there are things that we 
many of us who talked about that we may have a sense of how things are working, but we just have a sense and we don't have good data. Um, and starting to have actual concrete data, especially if we can establish in the future year over year data, will give us much more confidence about making good decisions as opposed to being more cautious because we don't know if it's a good decision or not. Warner? Um, one question about uh, coming from Linux is, um, do we have a sense from the survey, or maybe we need to add this next year, of how important uh, certain core Linux APIs that we don't implement are for people that are trying to do an alternative? And API is kind of a big net, everything from yeah. system calls to um, minus minus mumble on um, you know some command line that everybody's used to using or having improx in the base system or you know stuff like that. So. We don't have we didn't ask that so no we don't have that data. One of the things I think that we've learned this year and we'll probably learn every year are what are some things we want to ask going forward. Um, I know personally one surprise I really had was we had a question that was it said what. What server workloads do you use? But it, it's probably, was, it should have been a more accurate question is kind of what use cases do you use FreeBSD for? Um, and half the people that responded to the survey said they use FreeBSD as a development environment, which was higher than I expected. Um, and I think that's a question for next year. We'll want to kind of do a bit more deeper dive on, well, how are you, are, are you using it to develop FreeBSD or are you using it to develop other things and using FreeBSD as the place that hosts your IDE and so forth? That would be very interesting to know kind of which one of those it is, because I actually don't know which one of those that is. Like that was, because that wasn't the result that I expected. And that's like, I think that's a useful one to find out more information about. And there's other things like that. So when we find things that maybe don't match what we expect, um, that's a good thing, a good time to think about, well, what do we want to ask next year to kind of get more refinement and better understand something that we either wasn't something we expected or was kind of what we expected, but we need more data about it. So it's good to think about what we want to ask next year. Okay, so I have, we have one last thing. Um, <clears throat> we had some thoughts as a team of things that we think are helpful either perhaps to the next core team, but in general these are more um, useful to the community at large. Um, I think most people already know this, but it's good to always keep in mind that Members of the project, we all have limited time to do things, in particular limited volunteer time to do things. Many of the times when we do get sponsored to work on something, we're sponsored to like write code, more or less, um, as opposed to do other things. <laughs> um, so it's always good to remember that folks have limited time um, and we have all sorts of obligations like family and so forth outside of the project. And so sometimes when things don't move as fast as you'd like um, or as quickly as you'd like or smoothly, it's unfortunate, but it, like that's also we, we're not happy about it either. But it's just kind of the reality of the constraints that we have. So always being keeping that in mind about each other. Um, one thing that's really helpful, especially in the context of a core team, is the more people that are active in doing things, the, the kind of the less amount of work there is per individual. You can spread the load easier if you have multiple active people. Uh, whereas if you have fewer active people, then you have more people trying to carry more weight at a time, and sometimes that just doesn't work out. So anytime you see something that you could be helping with or, or see something that just seems to be worked on, go work on it and help because the more people that are active in doing things, the less work there is that each of us has to do as an individual. Um, another thing that I think we kind of know in the community, but it's, it's good to know and maybe not always obvious to, to folks who are newer um, is a lot of things that happen in our community, we're not a very top-down community. We are driven a lot by consensus and a lot by things that just happen within people in the project. So a lot of changes that happen inside of our community, whether we adopt, for example, when Fabricator was set up, that wasn't something that Core decided it wanted to do. Um, in fact, someone else did it and Core kind of said, oh, that looks neat. We think that's probably a good idea, like maybe a year later. <laughs> so a lot of change that happens in our community and, and, and things as we evolve over time, it's kind, of an, it's kind of driven internally by individual developers doing things. Um, so if there's kind of something you think would be useful to change, a lot of times um, just starting to do something different and starting to kind of uh, cut a new path through the forest, as it were, is the most effective way for that to happen. Uh, one thing that's kind of one of my personal things that I'll, I'll get on my soapbox for a second, a lot of things in our community, we try to work by consensus. We try to not have a lot of top-down direction. We try to have things where we, we, we kind of have a lot of freedom and autonomy as developers of where we want to push. Um, 
one of the things that makes that tricky is you want to actually know when you have consensus on something. Uh, one, and one of the properties we have in our community is when someone asks a question or, or makes a proposal, people who disagree with the proposal will voice their disagreements because you care strongly when you disagree with something. Um, but we don't have a very good culture of saying, yeah, I think that's okay. So a pretty common thing that happens in our community is someone will say something, uh, make a proposal or so forth, and we'll get like a handful of replies saying, yeah, that's kind of, but I don't like this part or this part, and then no one else responds. And so do the people who don't respond, is it because they agree with the thing and they are, many of us older people grew up with downloading email over modems and so we were all trained to not respond to emails unless we actually had something meaningful to say as a lot of content and to trim or quote, you know, you quote your, trim your replies and so forth because we're all worried about how much we're paying for our dial-up access still. Um, you know, if we operate under that mental model, then we're hesitant to reply and say plus one. Um, but actually, getting the plus ones is really useful to understand is there really consensus or not. And I think in our community, we still are pretty weak on giving the plus ones. Like we either feel guilty that somehow we're wasting somebody's dial-up bandwidth still because that's how the older folks of us grew up. Um, but it, it's really helpful to be vocal when saying, yeah, I think this is okay. Or, or something simple like plus one. That is a very valuable input just as much as I think this is wrong for X, Y, and Z. And so the, to the extent that people are willing to start doing more plus ones, that will be more helpful than having things move more rapidly. Because when we have a better sense of what real consensus is, we have more confidence on making changes. And without kind of that positive reinforcement, things tend to not change and get paralyzed instead. So that's my soapbox. Um, also, uh, if you're eligible at all to vote, vote. If you're eligible to stand, go ahead and stand when it's time to run for an election. Or it's time, to, not even for just core elections, but when, it's, when we're trying to find people to stand up on certain teams. Um, if you're younger in the community and you may feel uncertain about kind of less confident about, for example, you're not sure of everyone who's running for core and so maybe you feel like, well, I shouldn't vote at all. And it's much better for, to vote for, for three or four people that you have confidence in than to vote for nobody and kind of do a partial vote. So do that. Um, do at least some rather than none. And then it, it comes down to any time when you're kind of offering to do something. Um, this part about where change doesn't have to come from core. Um, if for folks who are new in the community, you may feel, well, I don't really have enough kind of uh, cred or something to like kind of push for something, so I'm just going to kind of sit back. Don't sit back. If, like, if you really do something crazy, you'll get some feed, you'll get some pushback. But if you're not getting pushback, probably we're just not all plus oneing, and so you should kind of charge forward. So, <laughs> uh, I think that's all the farewell kind of thoughts we have at the end of our term. And we want to give what remaining time we have for questions. And uh, I don't have to answer all the questions since I've been talking for a while. So we'll feel free to hand the mic around. This isn't so much a question, but kind of dovetails with the vote. Um, after the pizza thing tonight, I'm going to host kind of a boff for um, uh, bylaws 2.0. So if you're interested in that, uh, come see me. There's, John mentioned several of the problems with having a large core team, and maybe that's something we should talk about. Well, and don't just come see Warner. There will be a group discussion, and you should actively participate. Oh, yeah. This is going to be presenting. <laughs> I've got two slides that have like four bullet points. It's going to be real quick if I just sit there and read it. And I'm hoping that I get active feedback, you know, per particularly people that disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pablo. <laughs> All right, so A, how are we on time? Because I have no idea. Y'all are supposed to go with 10. So 1015 is when I think the next slide is. Okay, so we have some time for questions. So don't be bashful. Can you guys comment on uh, why were so few candidates uh, at the beginning? What was the reason or what are, what are your thoughts about that? So few which? So few candidates, uh, so few people. Oh, candidates, candidates for, for core? Uh, yeah, yeah. Haha. <laughs> Certainly not you as a phenomenon. Uh, well. 
all right, so I'll give my graybeard view a little bit. Um, I don't have the number in front of me. I think if you looked at the last, I don't know, several elections, maybe 10 years worth, you probably would see an overall dec like declining trend in the ripple who stand. I can certainly remember elections where we had 20 plus people standing for core. Um, and I know Ed has some things he might want to say. Do you want to go first and then I'll yeah. agree or disagree? Yeah, I, uh, I think the general, um, uh, general way that um, the number of people running for an election goes, it, it, um, we tend to, it, it's very close to the, um, the deadline that people submit their candidacy. candidacy. So uh, I think it's, it wasn't at all unusual that we had a lower number of, of candidates earlier on in the nomination period, um, and then it, it grew at the end. Um, that's that's completely normal. Um, I think there's a few um, a few things um, that just sort of uh, all coincided to to reduce the number of um, uh, folks running this time around. Um, in particular, we only have two incumbents um, running, which is a little bit unusual. Um, there's a few reasons that many um, many of the current um, uh, current team members are not running again, myself included. Um, you know, one um, we talked in the past about uh, a rotating um, uh, trying to introduce a rotating uh, third of the the team getting elected uh, every year rather than um, reelecting everyone every two years, um, and a number of folks on core um, follow that. Uh, effectively a self-imposed term limit um, and so that's the case case for me right I've I've run for two or I've been on the last two core teams um, and I'm taking this one off and then um, we'll presumably run again in two years um, and then there's also just some life events in various people's uh, that, that have um, uh, caused various people not to be able to to dedicate time to it again this time around so I think that's I mean that's my perspective on why we don't have a lot of incumbents um, uh, this time is just sort of a uh, coincidence of um, of different factors. Um, Benedict or Lee Wen? Yeah, so the positive thing that I saw is that more ports people are actually now running for core, n not just source people who in the past were more, yeah, yeah, I, I know source, I can hand out source bit this way. Uh, we're now seeing more ports people and a few more docs people, more than I would have probably seen, but um, yeah, I like this trend that's not just a team for that particular group, but also consisting of other teams that are also providing a lot of uh, value for the project. So I hope that will continue and also increase that we have a very balanced core, ideally three people source, three people source, uh, three people ports and three people docs. It's not always that way, but at least they provide their own insights and we have that this year with uh, Baptiste or uh, TC Burner and some others uh, that are also providing their viewpoints from uh, ports that we didn't have in previous course. Again. Yeah, and the uh, follow-up is it's very good that the uh, Baptiste and uh, Tobias, they are uh, bringing many existing ideas and the rules from uh, port manager team to core team and uh, we think that's good and uh, try to apply. And uh, uh, another thing about the nomination period is longer this year. That was because uh, uh, when the first uh, draft of the uh, election schedule came out, uh, uh, we got a feedback that it's exactly uh, less than as a uh, 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 vocation, national vocation in Europe, and uh, uh, there was a concern about uh, uh, if if the uh, people want to run for core have no time to uh, uh, sub submit the statement. But it turns out that uh, uh, it probably doesn't affect that much. So uh, things might be changed uh, in the next uh, in the uh, next election, but uh, that's the task for the next core team. So I think keying off one thing that Ed kind of mentioned, um, we do have fewer incumbents this time, but also if you look at the slate of candidates running this time, I would say we have fewer of the usual suspects. So many folks who have run for core on the, in the past are also not running this time. Um, I think some of that comes down to the fact that the last, 
I would say three or four core teams have been, for unrelated different reasons, more drama than typical core teams. And that people who are on those teams are more burned out than usual. Uh, and I think that caused, so for example, I think this time we have two incumbents and Alan is running, who's a previous core team member. I don't know that anyone else, unless my memory fails me, who's running is a previous core team member. Oh, Satosan. So yes, <laughs> sorry, Satosan. But a lot of the candidates who are running are not. They're, they're brand new folks. And normally we would have a mix of folks who are new and we'd have a, fix, a, a mix of returning core members. And I think the gap that we kind of have this year is we have um, far fewer former core members running. And I think I would attribute that to kind of some of the drama and burnout and things that happened over the last three or four terms, um, which just have various sources, whether it's personalities that were in previous core teams or specific issues that were dealt with. I know um, for folks who are on the teams that dealt with code of conduct, that was a pretty draining exercise and that burned out a lot of folks. Um, so things like that, I think, and, and I don't foresee that being a continuing ongoing exercise. I see that as a kind of somewhat of a temporary blip for a kind of a run of three or four teams that we've had that just had some blow ups. And I think eventually that will pass as folks get a little more time off and recoup and they'll be back to doing things. Um, and if we can have fewer family emergencies, which, you know, one has limited control over such things and when they line up, that will also help. Those are not a constant thing, but sometimes they cluster. So I, I do view it as more of an anomaly. I mean, I think there's a bit of a trend, but I think in particular this year, it's just kind of a bit of an anomaly as opposed to the definite future going forward. So <clears throat> one of the comments that I got uh, from somebody that ran in the previous one, but not this current one, was that historically, when the votes happened, you, they listed all the votes, you know, you know yep. both the winning and losing candidates. And last year, they only listed the votes for the winning candidates, and the losing candidates didn't know where they stood. And he said, you know, I ran, he was a relatively new committer mm -hmm. at that time, and, you know, I had no idea where I came, and so I just didn't feel like it was worth going through all the effort. And if I had, you know, known that I was, like, w within a few of getting it, I would have run this time, but I just couldn't get myself motivated to do that. Nope. So, Yep. The takeaway from this is please list all the votes, whether yep. you've got in or not. I, I, I definitely, I think that's very useful too, because it's, um, as an incoming core team, there's a sense of a bit of some folks have more mandate than others, to be very frank. And it's kind of good to know that in terms of how the community feels. Yeah. And, and, and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the public announcement sent to the announcement list only lists uh, the uh, elected members, the statics of elected members. But if you log into the elect election system, uh, you can see the full result. Yeah. yeah. So that means uh, a candidate who is for sure eligible for vote, he ca they can log into the system and see the uh, static of themselves. In, in the past, we've also, not this past time, but we'd also yeah. sent it as an email for the announcement to the developers, developers. list. Yeah. And that was different yep. this last time. I would change it back to the old way. I think I even emailed and said, can we please fix it? And it maybe didn't happen. But yeah, we normally send the whole thing to developers at because not everyone will go back and log into the system, but the email is pretty easy to see and low effort to get all the data in the email versus then having to go back and log into a system with a password you'd never remember. So. Oh, well, someone who has the, oh, that's true. I guess someone could have copied and pasted. I didn't even think of going and logging into get it and copy and pasted it, but. So I'm, I'm going to amplify a little bit on the burnout. Um, publicly, my reason is my daughter's graduating. But I was on the fence because of the burnout from uh, my last time on core. And I still don't know how to talk about that or how much I should say because it was personality driven and some of the personalities are gone and I don't want to be unfair to them, but I also want to voice that there wasn't a good uh, mechanism to deal with that. Uh, so I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to give good feedback to people because you want good candidates, you don't want to scare them off. And at the same time, you know, 
there is you know some amount of you know re respecting uh, other people enough not to complain too much and I'm channeling that into the bylaws thing tonight but uh, that's also something that's been going on because the last couple of times people have sent email to the list hey why isn't anybody running and everybody on core is looking at each other like do you want to tell them no I don't want to tell them <laughs> so um, we need to find a more functional way of dealing with that and I don't know what that is so I, I just want to voice that because I, you, you know what I'm trying to I, say. I will walk slightly further out the limb in saying that it is not a helpful, a mostly not helpful property to come into core deciding that you want to blow things up and burn everything to the ground and build from scratch. That mostly that doesn't be productive and doesn't turn out to be helpful. Because the things you blow up are people. And there's reasons the things are there oftentimes. Yeah. Some, some, some things evolve over time and there's not always, I mean, there's history and sometimes it's because it's what it ended up working even if it's not perfect. But yeah, going in with the mindset I'm going to burn it all to the ground and blow it up uh, has a wide blast radius. All right, that, that horse is kind of dead. Uh, how are we doing on time? Is it? Okay, so let's do like uh, one last question because then I've got to hand it over to folks from the foundation and make sure they have time to do what they want to do. No more questions? I'm mean, fine. Okay, Alan. <laughs> Especially with so few incumbents this time, how are we going to ensure better handover from previous core to next core? Because on my previous terms, that's always been a problem. For example, with the code of conduct, there was a lot of information that was not passed along. Um, so that's that's a that's a good fair question. Uh, a, we are trying to write up a specific document about things we think are worth noting for a handover. Um, one bit of advice I will also give to the next core team, do not take the current agenda as a starting point. Throw it away. We will give you some things that you may wish to, that we think you might want to add to your agenda that you create from scratch, the things you want to do, and that will be kind of the notes document we give you, but otherwise don't look at our stuff, because everyone gets mired with things that are hard problems to solve that have been around for 20 years that we're not solving. And like, oh well. Like you're better off picking a list of like three or four priorities, well three, that you want to work on as a team and kind of have that be your focus for your two years. Um, and, and then part of it is you have to leave enough margin for the fires and emergencies that come up, because everyone has their list of priorities and then we have the the issues that must happen right now that keep popping up and, and robbing your, your time, time that you have. But we will try to be diligent. We'll certainly have a meeting with old and new core on like a video call where we will talk about things. We can probably do more than one. Personally, um, I will also be always happy to talk about stuff um, and relate whatever history is going on behind things that you might inherit. Uh, I, I know I'm going to not, I'm not running this time because of family reasons, but I'll I'm trying to be, conserve my time to some extent, but I'll be happy to talk with anybody from Core 12. That's probably true of other members, but I specifically, I will be available. Okay, well, I, let me hand it over to the foundation folks and I gotta get their slides started. That is up first.